Welcome to Ask the Tech Coach, brought to you by the TeacherCast Educational Network. If you are in charge of professional development and looking to build an innovative digital learning experience, this is the podcast for you. Join us each week as we uncover strategies that tech coaches are using to drive their digital transformations one classroom at a time. And now for your host, with over two decades of experience working with tech coaches and ed tech companies from all around the world, Jeff Bradbury. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Teacher Cast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us today and making Teacher Cast your home for professional development. This is Ask the Tech Coach podcast, episode number 212. Today, we have a little bit of an international flair as we celebrate digital citizenship week today we're talking all about those things that you can do to bring in digital citizenship skills not only as a coach but as a member of your teaching organization hope you guys had a great summer i am so looking forward to the year by the time you're listening to this i will have been back in school for a couple of weeks working with my teachers getting to know all the great students that are coming in and I am so looking forward to some of the great things that are happening over on askthetechcoach.com. If you haven't had a chance to check everything out, head on over today to askthetechcoach.com. Scroll to the bottom. Join one of our instructional coaching groups today. We've got a great group over on Facebook, one on LinkedIn, and a brand new one I'm excited about on K-12 Leaders. Doesn't matter if you're a coach or a digital learning leader. We've got some great stuff for you. And we, of course, appreciate it when you hit the like and subscribe button and share this podcast with others. I have a fantastic guest on today from the great country and continent of Australia. I want to bring on today an elementary school teacher, Mr. Martin McGar. And Martin, how are you today? Welcome to Ask the Tech Coach. G'day, Jeff. Thank you very much. I'm very well. And you say um, you're finishing up your summer break there. I'm looking out the window, the wind and the rain that's coming in sideways. It is winter here, so I'm a little bit jealous of um, where you are right now. But thank you so much for having us. It is great to have you here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Well, um, my connection with the States is um, pretty recent, actually. I had the absolute pleasure of attending ISTE for the first time, um, venturing out of our continent, which, as a lot of people may have seen in the news cycle, we we have, were very locked down over the last couple of years. So it was very novel and very exciting um, last month or when, whenever it was, a couple of months ago, to actually venture over and attend the ISTE conference, which was so um, mind-boggling for me, the size of it. Um, my head was spinning, but in a great way. So um, my background is in primary school, we call it elementary school, classroom teaching. I had a real love of technology very early on when I saw the way that kids were engaged and it could really further enhance all the other areas of schooling. And through that pathway, through a range of roles in schools, I then found myself in leadership within um, digital technologies. And most recently, I founded my own business, which focuses on digital citizenship. And that's why um, I'm really excited today to really hone in on that particular element within um, our young people's learning and our young people's lives. Well, I am so excited to talk about this today because last year in my district, we went through a digital citizenship transformation. We got all of our coaches together. We created a brand new digital citizenship curriculum. And I kept thinking to myself the entire year, what does this look like in other parts of the world? Are students having the same issues? Are teachers struggling to teach it? Let's just kind of go through here and ask these questions because I think a lot of people aren't even now, 2022, clear on digital citizenship. They hear citizenship, they hear digital literacy. I think there's still a confusion. How do you define digital citizenship and how would you define digital literacy? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, there's definitely not a black and white answer. And and the confusion, as you alluded to there, often does create some of that um, that problem in it actually being implemented at all or effectively in school. So digital citizenship in itself, and I know um, ISTE uses that term as well as common sense, um, media uses that term digital citizenship. I like the way um, common sense education, common sense media, they break that digital citizenship into a number of like substrands because you, you can't sum up, in my opinion, digital citizenship as one thing and often probably the biggest misconception that I find within the schools I work with in Australia is the the term cyber safety, digital citizenship. Oh, as teachers, oh, that's cyber safety. And 
we fall into that perhaps trap and I'll see this firsthand as just teaching um, passwords and don't do this, don't do that. And, and we're sort of, and we tick it off as safety and digital citizenship goes so much beyond that. And it really comes down to the understanding of your behaviors online, your, the, the term digital footprint comes into it. Media literacy comes into it being a, um, being a critical thinker online, having empathy, troubleshooting, um, dealing with uncomfortable situations. So it, it's a very broad term and I probably haven't probably muddied the waters a little bit there, but I think it can't be boiled down to safety. That's a big one. And I loved at ISTE, the, the keynote, who's the CEO of ISTE, Richard Kilata, um, Kilata um, mm-hmm. used a term, uh, a, a phrase that he said, I'll get this right. Online safety is an embarrassingly low bar, which I really love that because it, 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 I think as educators, as coaches and classroom teachers, to just boil it down to, oh, we need to keep our kids safe. Absolutely. That's that's a non-negotiable, but it is so much more than that. And I love that phrase. And I think that's one of those tech coaches you could really take away to highlight in teachers' minds that safety, yeah, that's one thing, but that's just a really low bar. We want to go so far beyond that. I think one of the things that we're still struggling is that it's the and, right? Like we're going to teach this subject and then we're going to teach digital anything at this point. And we're struggling even as coaches to figure out how do we make it be that through? How do we teach social studies through the lens of, I mean, you can take the concept of, you know, let's, I'm a music teacher, right? So what would Mozart's Facebook page look like? How would, if Mozart had Facebook, what would his profile look like? What would he be posting? Would he be posting full symphonies? Would he be posting little musical phrases? How does that work? And you had mentioned the whole concept of digital footprint. I mean, that's a concept that is is so big yet i don't think teachers are aware that these are topics that should be brought into the general curriculum not left for something that the coaches talk about yeah i i I think again that is such a big um a, a big push that i find in my work is to just change that mind shift that yeah teachers don't need to find a digital citizenship lesson every week and put it in their timetable to teach digital citizenship my, my, I think best biggest advice to teachers is there is a time and a place for some explicit learning, absolutely. But we know in a crowded year and lots of learning happening, that's, that's limited. But finding that time to carve out a little niche for some explicit learning, whether it's a digital citizenship day or celebration, awesome. But beyond there, that's where, as you alluded to, Jeff, it, it needs to find its way into every curriculum area because we're on devices, young people, adults we're on devices every day so we can't leave digital citizenship at the door with your cyber safety your digital sit day in term in the first week of the the school year so I, I love that conversation you started there around and as coaches I think that's a really meaningful way that you can support classroom teachers in opening their eyes to where those links can be made because that's probably where it's falling down is, is that they see it as a standalone they need that that leader within their school, somebody who can make those pairings and, and go, hey, have you considered? Have you considered this? And it doesn't have to be that difficult. I mean, if I look at the curriculum that we created here, most of our kindergarten curriculum is simply how do you hold the device? How do you walk with the device? How do you treat the device? How do you treat somebody else who, ha- I mean, it's sometimes it, it's just that simple of, turn your computer on, turn your computer off, don't bend, don't break. Talk to us a little bit about how this is being taught in your neck of the woods. What does digital citizenship look like in Australia? Yeah, it's a good question where our curriculum, I know it's state-based over there. We we have a national curriculum, which is just interestingly in the last month or so, starting to change some language and, and has taken out Digital citizenship used to be a bit everywhere and it used to sit under ICT as a capability, they referred to it. But the language they're starting to use now, which I really like, is digital safety and well-being. They're capturing it under this digital safety and well-being, which sits under digital literacy. And straight away, they're changing um, that term from like cyber and ICT, which a lot of teachers are, are sort of 
um, standoffish because if, if they're not a techie style teacher or they're not comfortable, they the the, the phrase ICT or cyber straight away um, puts their back up. But in terms of how it's taught, to be honest, and I think probably you'd find this over there, I'd be interested in your thoughts, is it's haphazard. We've got some schools doing it really well, some schools um, very much probably the most common one is to, to have a little focus early in the year, have some sort of user agreement and probably leave it there. Um, but schools are doing it really well, uh, as we've said, and we'll keep coming back to it, are revisiting it multiple times throughout the year through really interesting ways. I have a feeling that a lot of school districts, and I would even throw parents under this one too, going, you know, my kids know how to use a computer, therefore they're good digital citizenships or <laughs> good digital citizens. Um, I'm sure you would argue that those two things are completely different. Uh, yeah, it, 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 particularly junior school, you hear this, yeah. Um, oh, the kids are so tech savvy. They're tech savvy. They're digital natives. They can swipe and they can zoom. But um, being able to pinch an iPad screen and navigate and close an app and restart is so far removed from exactly everything that is digital citizenship. They are, and this is probably a big one that maybe teachers don't feel like they can teach it to kids because they feel, well, I'm not tech savvy, so I can't be the Oracle or I can't be the person to support digital citizenship, but, but it's more than ever that they need the adults, the developmentally, emotionally, grown up people in their lives to be there to have conversations. It, it, it's not a rule book that you need as a teacher to be able to know the ins and out of, of the technology. It is so much more us as adults talking about empathy, talking about um, your um, what you put out there and, and what, how that reflects on you. And they're all very adult concepts that you don't need to be tech savvy to understand. So yeah, I think that's a big differentiation we need to make. Kids being tech savvy and being able to navigate something versus being digital citizens so far removed. Talking today to Martin McGarren here over on uh, digital citizenship topics. And your website is called Inform and Empower. You can find out more information of informandempower.com.au. A U, and I want to throw a couple digital citizenship topics out. Maybe you can kind of give us your first thoughts. How do you teach them? I know you have an opportunity to work with students and teachers on this. Social media. If we're looking at teaching social media, specifically in the in the primary grades here, what are some of the things that we need to be thinking about, teaching, um, worrying about when it comes to students, younger students in social media? Yeah. It it's an interesting one with, with social media and, and we, we know that the minimum age requirement, you must be 13 years of age to be on social media. I think schools can, in, in the, the younger grades can often fall into, well, it's something we don't need to worry about um, because they shouldn't be on it at that age. But there, I think a school is really not doing their due diligence to the, the children in not opening up conversations. So, Yes, we can't condone that kids jump on and sign up and falsify their age when they're under 13, but it doesn't mean we can't open up broader conversations about being online, about what you come across, how that makes you feel. Help-seeking, a big part of what we discuss is help-seeking behaviours. We want kids to feel, and you mentioned my business name, Inform and Empower. I think if you can capture what we want the adults to be able to support young people. We want them to be informed. We want them to know the ins and outs, but then empowered to, to be positive, to be the, the kind, the empathetic person online and know how to go about navigating a situation when it goes awry. Because we know kids are going to come up against situations that upset them, worry them, conflict. That's part of life. But we as the adults can definitely be the ones supporting them. And it's a bit more nuanced online than it might be offline. So I think, yeah, supporting that inform and empowering is the information, but the conversations, getting back to your question, social media, so much of that parallels social skills we teach kids. Um, in the offline world, my advice to primary elementary school teachers would be to ensure you're not just putting a line in the sand to say they're not old enough, we're not discussing it. I think that is the most unsafe thing we can be doing as educators rather than opening up conversations and preparing them for it. You had mentioned earlier that you can't have a social media account until you're 13. Do you support the idea of elementary classrooms 
having social media accounts that they can then teach through and maybe everybody votes on what the tweet should be and then that gets pushed out or you know you've seen ways of classrooms interacting with celebrities and medical professionals etc so that way there is that teaching of how social media works without giving an eight-year-old a twitter account Hundred percent. I think you've nailed that in one. We, in in those sort of impressionable years, the the tweens, um, like that eight to twelve, that's where they absolutely need to be exposed to social media. But I think you've hit a really great idea. A teacher having an account and then discussing, okay, we're going to share this photo. Wait a tick. What's that got in that photo in the background? Let's have a chat about. We don't want to share this, this, and that because that's something that we don't want public. Hey, the internet, who's going to see this? What if it gets reposted? Could that language, look, we're going to write this as the caption. Could that be misconstrued? Is that really black and white? Can people see the sarcasm in what we've written? All of that can definitely be modelled through class social media accounts and parents at home also doing a similar thing, having an account that they might share with the young person, but handing an eight to 12 year old, their own social media account without all those conversations, that's really problematic. And that's where I do see a lot of issues unfolding is where there hasn't been any mentoring, but absolutely mentoring is a fantastic way to have them ready for when they they do have their own account. All right, let's switch topics here. One of the big topics of ISTE was online gaming and this concept of, you know, when you're online, know who you're talking to, uh, stranger danger, all of that stuff. What are some of the things that we can be thinking about when it comes to, you know, using online games, getting uh, different accounts, things like that? What should we be worrying about there? Yeah, gaming, as we know, it's a huge interest. Um, Boys, girls, it's so wide ranging. As an educator, A big one I would be encouraging, whether you're a coach or a classroom teacher, is to find spend that little bit of time leaning into their world because it's their interest, it's their passion. I I really don't like this. I'm not interested in it, therefore we're not talking about it or I'm not even going to ask curious questions about it. And same goes for parents. I really encourage the best way to have our kids gaming responsibly and safely is to open, and I've said this a few times, I'm a bit of a broken record, but opening up conversations around their gaming, show an interest, ask, ask them why they love that game. Um, I've seen in Australia, I'm not sure I'd be interested, Jeff, in, in the States, we have esports leagues for our primary schools now. It, it's just in its infancy. There's a couple of startups over here in Australia who are actually having competitive esports in age appropriate games mario kart rocket league and fifa i think and i love that because it acts once again it has adults involved and supporting them in really positive and the teamwork that comes from that um is that something in the states in the elementary esports it's getting there um, it was a huge thing. I mean, I, I've got a friend who uh, recently left education to now lead the education division at Epic Games. Yep. And I just see him exploding this topic all around the place. And there was a lot of online esports, you know, even at ISTE, there was many, many hallways where they just had computers, joysticks, and <laughs> here's how you do this safely and respectfully. Yeah, and that's the whole thing. I, when I first saw esports in, in primary schools and you're like, these kids aren't teenagers yet, um, the first, obviously, question is, do we need them gaming more? But the big thing is it's not about more gaming. It's about the quality and what we can be teaching them whilst they're doing it because when they're older and, and, and they're into their teenage years, the horse is bolted. So yeah. I think this it's really formative years where I, to be honest, I would love to see more and more esports in though because they're playing the games anyway so why don't we bring it in you get the engagement and the other one which i do highlight with schools that it's really catering for the diverse needs of of your students so inclusiveness you've got a lot of kids in your grades who for athletics day for the school theater performance that's not going to be their interest that's that's going to probably be something they'll have regret and dread about being in but you imagine announcing that they can represent the school in an esports league you'll you'll find a group of kids who that will be their sole reason and their passion for being at school and i think we're mad to ignore that i'm curious on where you are with things like second life virtual worlds avatars things like that is that do you see that happening a lot where you know school districts kids are you know they're living completely different opportunities 
in school, out of school? Where are you with all the whole Second Life and, and you know, Avatar kind of things? Yeah, good question. It's probably one, to be honest, I haven't had a lot of exposure to amongst our, our cohort of young people here in Australia. There's the, dab, the, the gaming that I see them immerse online generally isn't in, in that second second life and meta um, metaverse. I'm not sure. 100% sure it's, of the meaning. It, meaning it's of- coming, right? I yeah, mean, all, yeah. all these major companies are creating these entirely virtual worlds with virtual currency and virtual entertainment, and it, it's it's coming. And you yeah. know it, it's it's adult. Mm. It, it, absolutely. And like anything, the ability to have young people, and this sits over, unfortunately, everything we, we teach our young people, the risks involved and worst case scenario, because you always do have to look at that when you're talking about young people online, being groomed and abused online. The moment you you create a virtual space for young people, you do know exactly who else is going to be there. And, and there, there are also conversations we have to have for young people not to sort of um, skirt around it. And as old as developmentally, they, they can have the conversation to let them know that there are people out there who will look to exploit and how at the moment I'm, I'm writing some content for my next presentations and really looking at, I'm, I'm calling them the red flags that I want. And this is sort of your 11, 12 year olds to look out for in, uh, in that age group. It's an interesting one, Jeff. We can, I feel we can no longer use that whole line of don't speak to people online. You've, you don't know offline. I think in the very junior years, yep, we can keep that going whilst whilst they're they're, they're little and they're, they're just getting. But once they're in that those upper years, that messaging is flying over their head because the gaming they're into the it, it's it's not a realistic one. I would much prefer to discuss with them the red flags about a messaging conversation, some dialogue you're having. What are the red flags that that is unsafe? How do we block? How do we report? Okay, let's shy away because there's so many positive interactions, but we want them to still be aware of it. Um, I think I've gone around in circles there. (laughs) Well, no, I'm glad that you just mentioned that. I want to pick up something that you said, which is the reporting, right? At some point, kids are taught to report if you see it. And at some point in time, tattletaling on your friends just isn't cool where do we go with this, right? How do we let people know what, you know, what is the right way of saying something? If, you know, you you can't tell a 15 year old report what your friend's doing, that doesn't always work, but how do we make sure that people are being safe and helping others stay safe online? Yeah. It's a really interesting one because that language you said there, dobbers, you're a dobber, you're, um, it, it has lots of negative connotations and kids use that, I, I think the the anonymity is obviously a great one to promote to kids that you actually don't need to be called out. That if, if you feel like someone's behaviour or something online is is causing harm or upsetting, you do have that anonymity, which obviously anonymity is a really big discussion online. How, where's the benefit to it? Because you'll often hear this, people shouldn't be allowed to be anonymous, but that's a perfect counter argument to say the reporting platforms when you can report things for example that's when that anonymity is really important that the people would not do that if their name goes against um marty mcgoran um flag this account well i wouldn't be doing it if my name gets posted next to that saying i've flagged it whereas um for young people to understand the a- anonymity of flagging and reporting i think that's one little step because that that's the really obvious one is um, that they don't want to be called out for the one who's actually done it. One of the topics that I know is meaningful to you is this concept of user agreements. What should we be teaching our kids about user agreements? Yeah, I, I'm a big one. And, and again, going back to Richard Collada at ISTE, he, he put up on the big screen a list of, um, and everyone had a good chuckle of user agreements that look like legal contracts. And they all start with do not, do not, do not, thou shall not. And hand up, I've been guilty of it in a school I've been teaching to have these long-winded user agreements. Now, a couple of things. I know from and every department I'm sure is different and district, but there might be a need to have some sort of rather legal mumbo jumbo. And if that is, keep that, sign it by parents, whatever it be, put it in a drawer. But that doesn't live in your classroom. That's not up on your walls as something that you you live out each day. User agreements. I think the big ones I would encourage and coaches can have um, exemplars ready to share with with classroom teachers so they can have a starting point. 
but they need to be positive. Number one, they must be written in the language of I will, I I like the language of having like a pledge at the beginning of the year, like I pledge throughout this year, I will be. Um, the language, one interesting resource that I do go back to often, Common Sense, uh, I've mentioned before, they're fantastic. Um, be Internet Awesome, which particularly because of the language used by that one, uh, smart, alert, strong, kind, and brave. So I've often fallen on that language to write user agreements with my, and and when I say write them with, that's another key point I would encourage you. If you waltz in day one of the school year and go, here's our agreement for the year, kids, sign on the bottom line. Do they have any ownership? Do they have any any, um, regard for that? You know the answer to that co-creating it, having them involved in it. So my, my natural flow that I'd encourage coaches and teachers is unpack some of those explicit learnings in, in the early part of the school year and don't make your agreement on day one. Have them have some learning and then co-creating that user agreement or a pledge, whatever you want to call it, and have it something they've been involved with. So when it does sit up on your wall, they go, oh, yeah, we, we did that together. And then have them sign it, put their, their signatures around it so, so they've got some ownership of it. But co-created positive language, I think, would be the big ones, Jeff. You've mentioned a couple of resources, Common Sense Media. You just mentioned Be Internet Awesome. We're going to make sure that we have the links to all of these things over on Ask the Tech Coach. This is episode number 212. Where else can teachers be going to look for resources on either creating their own curriculum or enhancing their curriculum with digital citizenship lessons? Yeah, I was almost going to flip that back to you, Jeff. In Australia, we we do use the common sense curriculum. We we don't have a we have a body over here actually called the e safety. It's a government body. They have a number of resources, and it would translate actually. It would be interesting to um, for have a US lens. Check them out esafety.gov.au, and and they have their own educator portal. They're a fantastic Australia-wide body who support both the education sector but also parents and um, they have a reporting platform, among other things. Um, And um, Common Sense, Be Internet Awesome, we have some other private um, providers. But, yeah, I'd I'd be interested, Jeff, beyond that in the States, what what are the resources that are the go-tos apart from what I've mentioned? It is a good question. And unfortunately, I draw a blank on these. You know, even when I was creating our digital citizenship curriculum for my school all last year, a lot of the stuff that I found came off of hashtags because people were posting it in their sites or their websites. But common sense, of course, has everything. Be mm. Internet Awesome was one that I had bookmarked constantly. But there are some sites. I mean, one of our good friends, Mary Alice Curran, she's all about digital citizenship. She's got digital citizenship conferences and and, and Internet chats and but it's still one person or a few people in her circle kind of taking the charge with all of this stuff. I find just using the hashtag of did sit hashtag digital citizenship and don't just use it on Twitter, use it on LinkedIn, use it on Facebook, use it on Mm -hmm. Instagram, find, you know, these hashtags that are meaningful to this um, internet safety. You can even do hashtag be internet awesome. And you can find a lot of stuff dating back months, if not a few years, um, I also do the combinations. I'll do, you know, hashtag dig sit space, hashtag isti chat. So that mm-hmm. way you start to see where these things pop, pop together. But I, I think that we do need to figure out where those common digital citizenship places are. Everyone seems to be trying to move in a direction, but I still think that's a good topic. I and mean, this is certainly a topic that we're going to be bringing up a couple times on the show this year because there's so many intricate topics inside of here. I mean, we could do an entire show and I hope we do on online gaming and online gaming safety or an entire show on meta life and meta worlds and, 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 and the second life generation that's going to be popping up in front of us. So if there's any resources, we are certainly going to be making sure that we update our show notes here over on two twelve. but uh, Marty, one more time, where do we go to find out more information about what you're doing and that great website of yours? 
Thanks, uh, Jeff. And a, a little shameless plug in terms of a resource, something I've just dabbled in is those very early years, like your five, six, seven-year-olds, I'm a big advocate for starting them early. Um, I've created, and um, you'll have a little laugh when you see the resource, it's called Ollie Online Down Under. And again, we, I'll share you the link for that. And they're a little series. I've just made four episodes at the moment, and they use song and they use music and getting kids actually engaged in some topics. So I would love, um, yeah, if anyone's interested, they're very much made for a US audience. Um, you get a little piece of Australia. You get myself mm -hmm. there aimed at that that younger years because I think that's probably where engaging kids before they're, they're really ready for those bigger topics is a great one. Um, but, yeah, uh, broader than that, um, on Twitter at Educator Marty, and I would love to hear what people over in the States are doing in this space. I'd love to be engaged um, in the conversations because as we've talked about today, everyone's looking to make this move towards a more broader approach um, and we're all in it together. Um, I would love to continue the dialogue. Jeff, thanks so much for having me, Mark. And of course, you're welcome to come on the show anytime. I think we're only, what, 12 hours apart, 14 hours apart? I think so. So uh, yeah, here. my day is just kicking on and you're about to... Uh, as we say in Australia, hit the sack, which is a, a white. Do you say that over there? Hit the sack? We do. We do. Oh, beautiful. There we go. I was going to say, I've, I've taught you a little Aussieism, but no, that's not <laughs> even something. <laughs> I'll, do I need to finish with crikey or something to make it um, genuinely Australian? <laughs> You can end this however you want. I'm, I'm happy that you're here. If you guys have any questions for Marty, let me know. You can, of course, find us over on Twitter at Ask the Tech Coach. And don't forget to head on over to AskTheTechCoach.com. Scroll to the bottom. Join our Facebook group. When last I checked, we were almost at that 1,000 coaches mark in that Facebook group. Our goal is to get to 1,500 coaches by the end of this year. If you're looking for a great professional development network, head on over to the Instructional Coaches Network today. We would love to have you. And again, thank you so much for hitting that like and subscribe button and sharing this with your personal learning networks. So on behalf of Marty and everybody here in the TeacherCast Educational Network, my name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you guys to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students. You've been listening to Ask the Tech Coach, hosted by Jeff Bradbury of the TeacherCast Educational Network. Please reach out to the show with all of your questions on Twitter at Ask the Tech Coach or online at www.askthetechcoach.com. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. And please take a moment to write a review in the App Store.